The Lisa Show, where we take a good look at life. Hi, it's Lisa. This is the last episode in our caregiving series, and it came about in an unexpected way. Something interesting that happened over the course of the 30 or so interviews we did for this series. My original plan for this season did not include an episode about how caregiving affects spirituality. My own experience with that felt sort of woven into all the other aspects of caregiving that we've already talked about, how to ask for help, changing relationships, loneliness, community, etc. And on top of that, while I'm sure you know by now that I'm a believer, we don't usually address faith on The Lisa Show head-on as a topic or an episode. Our guests and listeners come from all walks of life, and that's certainly true in this season as well. Although I love talking about my faith, I recognize that it makes a lot of people uncomfortable, so I'm mindful about it, and I try to keep it universal. And then— As I talked with our guests this season about our stories and our journeys in caregiving, I can't untangle my spirituality from my own journey, so it came up occasionally that I'm a woman of faith, or I mentioned that caregiving impacted my spiritual life, and I was surprised by the response. People had a lot to say and gave me feedback that they wished more of us would talk about this, even when we have very different beliefs. I started to realize that caregiving and spirituality weren't just inseparable for me. A lot of people are having this experience. So I began to include a question at the end of the interview, just a soft lob. Do you wanna say anything about your faith? It moved me deeply hearing from others and feeling my heart resonate with the way that caregiving and spiritual life inevitably intersected in one way or another, even and especially when that looked different from person to person. The voices you've already heard in episodes one through nine of the Caregiving series represent a rich diversity of spiritual perspectives, some of them with labels, Christianity, Buddhism, New Age, and others that were described to me as a journey without a label. You're going to hear some of those journeys in this episode. I'll share my own story too, but my hope is that you'll be able to feel what I did, which was the richness of how caregiving touches the soul in infinitely diverse ways and brings us in contact with the divine. In previous episodes, we talked about some of the weird conversations you end up having as a caregiver over and over again. The, let me know if there's anything I can do for you conversation or the normies conversation. And this is another one. I got comments like this frequently when I was taking care of my husband. You must be so angry at God. It's okay to be angry. Or, I bet you're tired of everyone telling you to look for miracles. Or on the opposite end of the scale, I bet you've felt so supported by angels all around you. Or, I can't wait to hear all the lessons you've learned. Right? That's kind of a weird thing to say, isn't it? Some bold assumptions either way. Everyone assumed my faith would change the longer I was a caregiver, and it did, but almost never how or when other people said. I think people do this because they're curious, because they don't know how they would cope or react if they were in your shoes, but they think if they can guess, it will confirm their own beliefs, which is comforting for them. Meanwhile, the friends who are truly curious want to hear about your experience, and they ask questions. The ones who don't want to go deep or to actually know make a lot of assumptive statements instead. As a result, I felt an unspoken pressure from others to give up my faith. Look, you tried, you followed these rules, and life didn't work out for you. And at the same time, an unspoken pressure from others to be a spokesperson for faith. Oh, you have so much to teach people. This is such an extreme situation. Neither one felt like my experience. But I did experience something that many caregivers described to me also. The first part of a caregiver's spiritual journey— and that was friction. My experience was was difficult. I was surprised. I I consider myself a strong woman, a faith-filled woman, but that knocked me a little bit winded. That was Sheila Welch, and this is Kara Riska. Well, I can say it has broken down my faith and grown it back up. 
because I think that if I look back at the faith that I had prior, Mm -hmm. I would have thought it was very strong and I was very happy with it. I think that for me, what I learned is that I based God's goodness on things going the way that I wanted them to go in my life. God's goodness, or balance in the universe, or karma, some higher power that administrates love and or justice, is a major pillar of spirituality for many people. And one of the challenges to faith that I felt and that others have described to me is what can feel like a juxtaposition between that love and goodness, or at least justice, and the brutal suffering that a caregiver witnesses in the person they love. And it turns out that set me up to be really disappointed in God and to feel like God was not showing up for me, like He had forgotten me. And that was obviously really painful to go through. And I went through a long season where I was a little bit like, well, fine. If you won't show up for me, then I won't show up for you. (laughs) And I remember really feeling that way. Like I'm joking about it now, but it was really... Um, I was mad. Yeah. I was like really, really mad. Yeah. And I, you know, kind of wanted to give God like a little bit of the finger, like be like, no, this is not, this is not going well. And I can't say that that didn't come up again, right? With the re-diagnosis and just, you know, again, looking into your child's eyes and explaining <sighs> to him what he's going to have to go through. Like that has you kind of be like, what's going on, God? Like, this, come on. Yeah. Watching someone you love suffer is inexplicable. It changes you fundamentally as a person. There are silent moments we all have in life that cause a fundamental shift in each of us. I have experienced a few of them. They come out of a deep pain that we don't think we can physically endure. And to be fair, maybe we don't really endure them without taking damage to our souls and for sure our bodies. Whether it's voluntary thought or not, I don't think it was voluntary for me. When you're confronted with the extreme human condition in caregiving, whoever administrates justice in your belief goes on trial because it's not fair. That hurts. And the harsh reality is there isn't time to establish faith when you're caregiving because in many instances, and certainly in mine, you're too busy taking care of the here and now. For me, a large part of that was just trying to make Christopher comfortable the stress of repeatedly attending to someone in pain and discomfort, anticipating the next emergency, sometimes successfully, sometimes not, changed the way I see life, other people, what I think about, what I worry about, what the purposes of our bodies are, and a hundred other changes. And I want to give you a spoiler now that this is not how the episode ends. So many people told me about an experience like this, a disintegration of the way faith looked or felt before their caregiving experience. But none of these stories ended there. At least for the people who were willing to share with me, this experience was the first act in a faith transformation. Now, what exactly the putting back together process looked like was very different for each person. And to be honest, most of us are still in progress. When I look at faith, I think for me, it just looks like the constant seeking and being aware that like the enemy of love, the enemy of God is that doubt that God is good. Mm -hmm. So that we then turn to ourselves and kind of rely on ourselves. And I think that that sometimes it can feel a little bit more certain because like we know what we have. And sometimes Mm -hmm. it's very, very vulnerable to ask and, and trust God again. And so I think being in the conversation of, okay, God, like, I know you're good, but show me. Mm-hmm. Let me understand. Let me feel your goodness again. Even though I know that all the sad things and hard things are going to go away, like, let me trust this again. Help me trust you. And that's kind of been my prayer lately. Kara's prayer, help me trust you, is so beautiful to me. I know that one of the big ways my faith has transformed is that before, part of me must have felt that my faith was transactional, that if I do these things, check these boxes, I will get other things in return, now or later. I don't think of it that way anymore, even if maybe some of that is true eventually. My faith is in the here and now, and the questions I find myself asking are a lot more open-ended. Instead of, well, some prayers are answered and some are not, or they are not yet, which one is this? It's questions like, what might this mean? 
Who does this reveal I am? What is the truth in this moment now? How do I move forward using what I know and not forgetting? I think in that way, faith is simpler now. It's a lot more prayers that sound like, help me trust you, no strings attached. Rewinding a little bit, there was another major transformation to my faith that happened as a direct result of caregiving, and I found words for it, thanks to David Shank. Well, my practice is Buddhist practice and Buddhist meditation and being involved in different Buddhist communities. The first thing I would say about this is being involved with hospice has taught me that the body knows how to die. That the body knows when it's time and how to shut down. You probably know this very directly. You know, different parts of the body get quiet and they stop and then other parts and motion slows and to me that's enormously comforting it's it's like the miracle of the body comes forth and is life but then it also knows how to just very gently fold itself back down into completion and to me that's the when the death occurs that way, it's the completion of the miracle. You know, there's some deaths that are awful. You know, my father died. I was holding on to him. I was raking the vomit out of his throat. He was, I mean, it was terrible. It was terrible. But there are so many other deaths that, that show what the body knows about itself. And then I think we can learn from that about every part of our life. The miracle that David is describing is something I felt and experienced firsthand. The body is truly miraculous. I would care for Christopher and then go outside and run because I could. And if I have a bad body image day, I remember what a miracle it is to be able to sit up, to stand, to walk, and how I can never take that for granted. And just like giving birth to five beautiful babies, I just never forget the miracle each one is. I can't deny the miracle of how the body knows how to die and how it knows how to prepare for death. Christopher described it as a light within burned out. The hospice nurse explained that each system in the body was like a light switch. And just like you shut down the house for the day by going from room to room to turn off the lights one by one, that's what our bodies do to prepare to die. And I've seen many births, but only two deaths firsthand, so there was always some mystery to it. Just like the births made me feel like something magical, otherworldly was happening, that we don't really get to see all of it, I felt similarly to death, that my eyes couldn't really see everything that I felt was happening. When I try to identify why faith starts to rebuild itself for caregivers, even when life doesn't always get better, when the circumstances that can shake faith don't always resolve— I think about this. As a caregiver, you are immersed in the mysteries of life and death, and your perspective expands. In those sacred, mysterious moments, you find evidence of things that you can't see, things that are intangible but undeniably real. This opens the door for faith that pain had previously closed. In David's story, his father's death was traumatic and terrible, as he described. But in the knowledge he gained as a caregiver, he could still believe in the profound miracle that occurs at death in the body. Caregiving reveals those miracles and gives you new vision. Many caregivers like Aisha Atkins describe to me how this vision changes the way they live. There was a pivotal moment caregiving the people who raised me where you know, one of those times when I felt like I was missing out on things that my peers were discovering. And I very distinctly heard God tell me that I have one set of parents. I won't get a second chance. I won't get another opportunity um, to be present with them, to have this very demonstrative moment of love where I am acting out my love for them every day. And, you know, other things that people are experiencing, I'll get to experience, or maybe I won't, but there's no comparison. And for me, I've been really blessed with phenomenal parents. And so it's been a pleasure to be in this relationship with them. Just really a changing of my priorities. 
to allow me to be present, not perfect, but present. And that's, uh, I think one of the biggest takeaways that I've had on this spiritual journey is the gift of caregiving as being present with the people who raised me and, and who love me. Living in the present with the people I love, like Aisha describes, is a change in myself that I noticed, a different focus in my spirituality and even in just the way I see life in general. Caregiving left a deep impression that what we do really matters. Being present matters. Relationships are everything. That's what Christopher taught me and how he lived and how he died. Another thing that resonated with me from the stories of other caregivers in their spiritual journeys was the experience of quietly finding God or the universe companionship in the darkest moments of being alone. This is Sheila Welch again. For every choice, I prayed through them. Faith is extremely important, and what I see on the other side is a deeper knowledge of how God held me when I was too tired to know it, and how He will always hold me whenever there are difficult times, and I'm either too dumb to know it or I'm too tired to know it. You know, he's holding me. The biggest transformation to my faith is not the hope and belief that God is with me, but the knowledge that when no one else could be there for me, God was. Even when I couldn't feel it in the moment, the faith to know that I wasn't alone when I felt alone has meant the most to me. Jillian said something beautiful about this in our conversation, and she shared a metaphor that I've thought about ever since. You know, there's a truth I don't want to be true, but it continues to be true in my life through um, multiple unexpected experiences, and that is that I have never felt God's presence more than in my worst moments. So that is something that I hold on to. Um, What I've really learned I would say if I had to sum up my faith lessons into one lesson through all of this is that I believe that we have a God of resurrection. Um, and what I mean by that is that not resurrection is not just a promise of what happens to us at the end of this life. Um, it's a promise that happens in and out and over again through all of the small deaths we experience in this life. And um, there's a part in the book where I had like an illustration for this, but this, this might relate to some of your listeners. When we did live in Alamogordo, uh, we lived in our, in our backyard basically was White Sands National Monument. And if you look at the White Sands, it's just a beautiful picture. Um, and you could just go on knowing that it's just a beautiful piece of scenery. But if you dig deeper into its story, you'll realize that it's the product of death and resurrection. That area of New Mexico was once covered by a giant lake that dried up and it left behind gypsum deposits. And then the whipping winds and harsh weather came and broke down those gypsum deposits. And that's why we have the scene that we have today. And the reason I say that is because that lake is never coming back. We're never going to get the land that once was. But God takes dead things and brings new life out of them. And I think that's what he does for us when the unexpected hits our lives. We may never get our old lives back, those of who are listening who are caregivers, um, but new life can come and beauty can still exist amongst the harshness. New life can come, and beauty can still exist among the harshness. If I've learned nothing else from so many raw and beautiful stories about spiritual transformation and caregiving, it is that even in the context of a single spiritual journey, even small deaths lead to new life. For the people who asked me about my experience as a caregiver, not the ones who made assumptions, but the ones who truly did or do want to know, I think a lot of times they are really saying, how do you endure it? It sounds awful. There are moments that I don't know how I survived or how I do, 
But after spending time in that space of examination and fear, I have chosen and felt that it was true to assume that none of the pain or struggle of this experience is wasted, that somehow this is part of my transformation and growth and it will work out in the end. Maybe some things are random, but I really don't think that. I choose to believe that all things are known and guided by a loving Heavenly Father and that I don't have all the information about those details, not for lack of asking, seeking, wondering, pondering, or insisting. I don't have a full understanding. I have more than I did 10 years ago, but I simply don't know. When those painful moments come now, and they inevitably do, I pray with the assumption that God is there listening and that He loves me. It seems so basic and simple, but even after a lifetime of trying to do that same thing, I have a deeper feeling now that God trusts me, a greater fullness in our relationship. There are some experiences that I've only had with Him or shared with Him, and it has given me a spiritual confidence that feels solid and peaceful. I feel I'm trusted to make the hard decisions I need to differently than I did before. And I know that there's so much for me to learn about life, my relationships, my faith, my purposes here. And I don't know if I'm emerging from the chrysalis or still inside it, probably still inside. Every day is different, but most importantly, I am loved, I'm not alone, and this life is happening now in the present. And believing that right now is the only choice I have to make to keep finding new life in my spiritual journey. At the end of this caregiving series, I have so many people to thank. I cannot express how grateful I am to everyone who has participated in the conversations that made up our series here on the show, in the messages that you've sent to me and our team, in our listener community on Facebook, and in the conversations that you've started with other people. Sharing these episodes and helping us spread the word about communities and resources that make such a big difference. Thank you for taking this journey with me. Thank you for your patience as we process some trauma together and tried to parse out a topic so complex that it's really impossible to fully say everything that needs to be said about it. And thank you for being a part of my support system. This never ends. Of course, I'll never really be done talking about it. <laughs> but once upon a time, I wasn't sure I'd ever be ready to take on a deep dive on something so intense and personal, even though I knew how badly I wished that I had something like this when I was caregiving. I couldn't have done it alone. And if you are hearing this, I know you were a part of that. Lisa's show is a production of BYU Radio. The show is hosted by Lisa Valentine Clark and produced by Becca Hurley and McKay Menden with help from Blake Morse, Avery Stonely, Michael Combs, Victoria Rymington, and Allie Bird, and with music and post-production by Gracie Davis. Special thanks to Sheila Welch, Kara Riska, David Schenk, Aisha Adkins, and Jillian Benfield. You can find links to their work in the episode description. The Lisa Show team is hard at work on our next series, so while you're waiting, make sure you're all caught up on episodes of The Council of Moms. Just search The Lisa Show on YouTube to watch Lisa and friends answer questions submitted by listeners like you.